I want to take this opportunity to kind of combine everything we've mentioned so far. We've been talking about innovation. We've been trying to think about the future and pain points and gatekeeping, bucking tradition, institutions that need evolving, taking risk and combining different skill sets, which you are yourself doing with your computer programming skills and your conducting skills. So after many years of service at Google, and there was some exciting news. Drew and I were like, oh shit. Oh shit. You know, <laughs> oh shit. I was like, oh, this is good. Coinbase, which is probably the biggest known crypto institution, exchange. so to speak, yeah. that mm-hmm. people are aware of. When, when, we, when you first go to buy some crypto, you're going on Coinbase. And so it's super exciting uh, to have one of our musician brethren to go in there and be a representative at Coinbase. So we'd like to really dig in uh, yeah. for the rest of this conversation on the crypto space. We've now had a couple guests and like now we got someone who is in it to win it, working at the top of the game. So how'd you get Coinbase? How'd that work out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I've been at Google for seven and a half years, long time, right? I enjoyed my time there. I've learned a ton. You know, as a software engineer, it's you learn so much just like building out systems that hit, uh, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users a day. But it was time. Um, and, you know, working there during the pandemic, from home, there were just a lot of factors that made it not as pleasant to work there, at least where, where I was sitting. Mm-hmm. I was leading a team of about 13 engineers and you become responsible for their careers and you wanna see them grow, but it's really hard to do that when you're like not in the office necessarily. But also like, you know, in the thick of the pandemic, September, October, November, 2020, it was really toxic politically in America during that time, I'm sure you remember. Oh my and, God. Yeah, well, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. And, yeah. And Google is very much like a microcosm of that. You know, just because Google search is like a reflection of the American or the world id, right? It's just people type in and that's the work, you know? So um, I decided it was time to leave. Um, So, you know, I I did, I hadn't, you know, set my mind on Coinbase. I I was interested in crypto. I had been investing in Bitcoin since about uh, the 2017 bull run, 20 and then 2018 crypto winter came, but like I kept reading about it. But, you know, one of the places I interviewed after uh, Google was Coinbase and I went through the interview process. And, and as I interviewed, I started reading more, more. I got into Ethereum a lot. That ended up working out. And so uh, now where I sit is actually really cool. Uh, I sit in the crypto org. So as you can imagine, like it's a big company. Obviously, you think everything is related to crypto, but it's not, right? There's like the exchange component. There's the venture capital arm. There is... Um, the prime brokerage component, uh, there's the, the front end business logic, there's data analysis. And, you know, the, the place where I sit is actually the technology that interfaces with uh, all of the blockchains that uh, Coinbase uh, allows for trading and withdrawals and interactions and so forth. So I work on the systems that um, service liquidity uh, for Coinbase. So like if you ever want to withdraw crypto from Coinbase, that goes through our systems. And I, I tend to specialize in Ethereum L1. And so like I'm responsible for making sure Coinbase will get through the merge, uh, which is scheduled for Q2 2022 and uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. Can I just say, I can't wait for the proof of stake movement for Ethereum. It's time. It is just time. We've been waiting. We've been waiting. <laughs> and I'm curious. So, so if you made an altar in your closet, that you would go and like light a candle for? Would it be for Satoshi or would it be for Vitalik Buterin? I mean, they're both uh, they're both amazing for different reasons, right? Satoshi just being pseudonymous and creating this myth of value created from nothing is pretty remarkable in and of itself. What's amazing about Vitalik is like how approachable he is. Ethereum is an amazing thing, right? These all core devs meetings where ha- which happen biweekly. And they talk about like the intricacies of the node software and like the decisions they're making about the design and so forth. These are open meetings. Anybody can go. They get posted to the Ethereum Go Discord. If you just click through the right links, anybody can go, right? I have to go because I have to make sure this is where Coinbase. Yeah. But like, there, you know, there's no reason like you couldn't go if you wanted to. And, you know, Vitalik's on the call. It's like 30 of us. He's just another person that's like trying to figure it out. I mean, he's off, he commands a certain level of respect, but like, People routinely like challenge his uh, opinions, raise counter arguments and so forth. And he, you know, he takes in a stride. And like, I think he's been a remarkable leader of a $500 billion 
uh, market. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have trouble wrapping my mind around it. But um, yeah, I mean, I think they're both they're both amazing. And he's younger than us too, right? He's pretty young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's I don't know what I would have been doing uh, at his age. Probably playing League of Legends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he does. He does talk about how um, one of his motivations for designing or thinking about NFTs was because he wanted the gear he bought in World of Warcraft to translate to other video games, right? Mm. And that was his first moment where why can't we just digitally own property that's uh, mutable across various platforms? I wish my musings turned into $500 billion <laughs> issues. <laughs> like, like, oh, but wouldn't that be nice? But I'm, I'm so happy we have, we're able to have you on here because we've had so many people kind of like leading up to this. So we can feel free, feel free to get into, into the weeds <laughs> Uh, yeah. and uh, zoom out as much as possible. Tying this back into music, what are we going to do? I mean, obviously there's some <laughs> like NFT, uh, oh, okay, ownership of songs, some rights here, some some tickets here, which is something Drew and I are working on and many others. And so there's some kind of like surface level, like obvious things that can tie in, but at, at a larger scale, how is music and classical music going to be able to embrace this tech what are some of going to be some of the first like impacts it makes into there and what should we do to not get left behind how do we fit blockchain into the puzzle yeah it's a great question i mean it's certainly one a thing i've been thinking about uh for a long time what's interesting to me as a meta comment here is like we have one of the og web 2.0 classical music founders in this chat here in the form of drew ford right <laughs> like it's true. It is true. No, I mean, that's in your bio, fact. Drew. Web two. <laughs> Web two. Web two, uh, two classic. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, because I, I remember when, when you were like uh, building your Instagram following like in the early days, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I kind of followed suit. And um, for crypto and classical music, it's an interesting question. I don't have a specific answer for you. Obviously, you've had Sam on, and he has a vision for making group music a DAO, tokenizing it, and so forth, which is potentially viable. We've talked together about uh, about that too. And I have some questions on that, but it's certainly something worth trying out. Here is how I do think about it. Again, I don't have a full end-to-end -end solution for you, right? Um, but here is how I do think about it. Right now, if you look at the space of culture on the chain, and when I say culture, I mean everything from art NFTs, profile picture NFTs, to uh, music NFTs, which are starting to emerge, Royal.io, SoundBetic.yz, et cetera, to, you know, sort of the discourse um, on chain, right? Like whether it's Twitter or like decentralized social networks like DSO, et cetera. That culture is very narrow. It's essentially like a crypto punk aesthetic. It's pixelated. It's extremely technical. It appeals to a very small set of developers and you really have to dig into it. It's technocratic. It's very like largely male, right? L lots of dudes uh, and lots of uh, non-dudes. There's like some elements of like anime interspersed, but it's like a very, very specific culture. You know, so what are the top NFT series? Today, there's a lot of news about how Bored Apes flip CryptoPunks, but you have like CryptoPunks and you have like animal JPEGs, right? And that's sort of the culture. To me, there is so much opportunity and so much room to enrich on-chain culture right, to infuse the blockchain, to put stuff on the blockchain that is high quality culture. And it uh, expresses a far more diverse set of viewpoints, perspectives, and aesthetics than uh, is currently on chain. And I think there is a massive opportunity there. I think some startups are starting to think about that. With classical music specifically, I do think there is an angle where ironically, one of the things, well, maybe it's not ironic, but like, one of the sort of aesthetics or principles around classical music is how sort of rarefied it is, right? How special it is and how scarce it is. There aren't that many people who play the violin. There aren't that many people who can play, you know, Beethoven concerto, right? Like it's hard. You need years and years of training. So if you take that angle, maybe there's a way. Now there's a problem there is like, okay, then maybe it's just Joshua Bell who releases NFTs and then we're, that doesn't solve anything, right? So I don't, I don't quite have the answer for you. Like, I, again, I, I wish I had an end-to-end -end solution. I've been thinking about this a lot. And it doesn't help that a lot of people, both in music and classical music, are going to be come out of the gate being extremely skeptical of blockchain anyways. 
Uh, so, oh so we man, what an done. understatement. <laughs> We've all been yeah. on Twitter. We've all been on Twitter. Like, it's tough. Cool. It's tough. Yeah. Can I, uh, hop, can yeah. I hop in for a second? Please, please, please. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more about the culture aspect. It is very homogenous, very monolithic. It's it's a lot of Caucasian male energy there. And with I the was sprinkled like, anime. It was the perfect spring, description. Dude, a couple like, of waifus. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> Look, I'm gonna just say it. Everybody's thinking it. We need some black people on the blockchain, y'all. Like, if you oh, want sure. some culture, you gotta get some sisters on there making some memes, dude. It's it's a wrap, man. It's over. It's Definitely. over it, producer Daniel saying amen. This is something that I've been wondering if this is like part of what my mission should be personally. Mm. This is actually something I've never said out loud or don't think I have, but maybe I need to like be getting some black people in on blockchain. Cause like it's what you said. We've seen it over and over and over and over again in history, in ecosystems. It's just almost every aspect of life, diversity breeds strength and abundance. Right. And so we need to have more diverse voices in on this uh, on this journey. I want to break it down because, like, I don't know if our listeners have heard all of our blockchain episodes. A lot of people still think crypto is a scam. Right? Yeah, yeah. You were so kind in saying that I was like a pioneer of Web 2. I'm trying to be a pioneer of Web three as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? I didn't mean that as an insult. You know it's really I mean? fun. No, it's great though. <laughs> no, I've never Beautiful. even considered myself to be that, and I'm honored to to have been, you know, given that. So, I, I I'm wondering. Let's just be devil's advocate, right? I've been in these clubhouse conversations where people are telling me that I'm wrong and that this is all a scam. How would you explain to somebody who believes the apex of musical achievement was Brahms that, you know, <laughs> making an NFT or having digital scarcity and ownership of your art as an artist, why is that important? And how, how would you explain that to them? I would probably start by acknowledging there are tons of scams on, in crypto. That is a fa- the fact. So there's a reason for that perception, and we shouldn't deny that, right? 100%. And the reason it's a scam, there are a bunch of scams is because there, you know, there aren't as many rules, there aren't as many regulations. It's like the early days of the internet. Also, Nigerian like people, <laughs> yeah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and people can make a lot of money scamming. So that perception is not wrong. That doesn't mean the whole thing is a scam. It just means there are a lot of scams on it. So uh, we need to distinguish between those two. Why is digital scarcity and ownership uh, and in the context of music important? I think if you want to make that argument, you really have to believe in a couple of things. And if you if you believe Brahms is the apex of musical achievement, then you may have trouble getting to these even premises. The, the first premise is more and more of our lives are becoming digital. Now, that is very obviously true for all of us in this room, right? And it's true, I think, for the majority of people, for instance, not maybe not the majority, but many of the people in the United States, uh, certainly probably a plurality, right? Like a sizable number of people, especially during the pandemic, even if they're employed, they're playing video games. Uh, if you're working, a lot of people are working from home. Most people own smartphones. Uh, most people transact uh, digitally. And that is a trend that has only increased over the past 20 years, let's say. If, if you believe Brahm is the apex of human achievement, maybe you don't, you know, have an email address. So you don't care. Right. <laughs> so, but okay, fine. Then we're having two different conversations, but okay. Yeah. If you believe uh, more of our lives are becoming digital and th- the second premise you have to buy into is that people should accrue value for what they contribute and contribution can come in many forms. The traditional model in music uh, has been, you know, if you're lucky, you get signed to a record label, let's say, and then you get an advance or some portion of proceeds of the of the revenue stream. But really what's happening is the record label is sort of assuming that your risk, but like if you blow up, the, uh, you know, they get the majority of the streaming revenue, they get the majority of the album sales and so forth. But, you know, they're swallowing that risk for you. Um, and in the worst case, if you're a musician, you never get signed to a record label and you, you sort of have to self-distribute. Maybe you do own uh, your own IP, but like you may not have the full package, uh, full set of tools needed to distribute your content and to monetize it. 
-hmm. So if you believe in those two premises, then what blockchain does provide is very much an end-to-end -end solution for the distribution and the ownership of your music as digitally scarce resources. So, you know, NFTs, for instance, right, are, are probably the most fitting model for this. NFTs, you can prove, okay, this person, there are, you know, 25 copies of this song, let's say, right? And these are the people who own it and you can prove it. And because it's on the blockchain and the blockchain is recognized as a legitimate ledger of transactions, that proves aspects like provenance, authenticity, uh, and ownership. And it gives you an out of the box way to accrue value from it because you don't have to go through the rigmarole of, okay, I have to issue CDs. And if I put it on Spotify, uh, you know, I'm going to get 0 0.001 cents per stream, right? It's, it's a much more direct transactable method. So those are the reasons I think if you're a musician, you, you believe that uh, accruing value for your contribution is important and you believe increasingly our lives are going to be digital, then I think there's a strong argument for why this is important for musicians. And uh, that's such like uh, like a beautiful, like nice, concise, really clear way to kind of explain what we're dealing with. And I definitely agree with both of you. The thing I want with music and just artists in general is that thank you. Thank you, white Twitter bros. Uh, with, with anime, you know. <laughs> thank you for your service. You, you did a great job. This is really cool. It's time for other people to kind of come in and in this, you know, we're in this almost like third, third wave of this to bring in outsiders, people who aren't just stuck solely in the tech of things. Drew and I have a lot to thank our, our dear friend, Brian Lee, who is uh, like now a, a business partner and a, a, men, a blockchain mentor of sorts, uh, because he saw himself performing on Broadway and playing shows, being a musician to being like early adopter of this tech and really building on this tech and being in really deep into the ecosystem. He noticed this large gap between the people building it and the people who came up with it and what does it need to evolve and what at least i see that's encouraging is that unlike some of the problems of the classical music sphere which might not have reached its pain point it seems like blockchain is going out now and more and more people who don't necessarily have that tech background or my, who might not have like a full grasp of what's going on are realizing its value and people are finally bringing it in so brian he's our uh, red pill blue pill Mor morpheus thing and has brought us into this space and so well, i mean that's what at least we're trying to do is introduce this and so i agree for me and maybe for all of us it's like we want to see it at the table this technology is here whether we like it or not and you know are we going to use this nuclear energy to to kill everyone or are we going to use this these nukes to power the world it might do a little bit of all of this but <laughs> i want to be a part of that conversation i don't want to be sitting out there with someone else deciding what to press the red button uh, as opposed to giving me um, you know the ability to charge my iphone Preach. so if we can get more people in there it's like that annoying thing they might be complaining about on twitter uh, could tr very well transform their lives and it's probably going to be a part of it Come on board, and if you don't like something about it, ha have a say on it. We, we don't have a say with Facebook. We don't really have a say. Yeah. We kind of have to be there because that's how you get gigs. We don't really have a say about email. You have to have one or you're not going to get the gigs. You, you, like There's so many things that have kind of left our hands, and so I'm like, yeah. this is still early. You have an opportunity to have agency to yeah. be able to gain power, to gain financial independence, to gain all the potential nice things or get scammed. Uh, you also have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But now's the time. Come in here and you actually can have an impact on the next gen of the economy, the next gen of the arts uh, administrations. So it's it's time. We got to get people in there. Other than your, your hilarious and, and active Twitter. Which I praise you for, and love the the pudgy penguin. It's beautiful. Um, thank you. Thank you. Shout outs. Are there some things we can do to bring people in easier? Even the low hanging fruit that are probably interested. What are some things that are in your mind on how to kind of bring people in and bridge that gap? Yeah, I'm going to be very brutally honest here. Be brutally um, honest. Let's hear it. I think the most impactful thing you could do is. Figuring out the music on chain musical thing that sells for 20 ETH. Okay. Right. Once the proof of concept, once the market, you prove the market, everyone's going to, LA Phil will start calling because everyone wants money. That's the, that's the, I want 20 ETH. I'm a yeah, big yeah. fan. 
I'll take that, it. Sh- any of our listeners, my uh, wallet addresses. Zero X. Yeah, yeah. Zero X X four four seven. I mean, that's generally how things work in crypto, right? It's like because it's it's just essentially a massive free for all market. The market is is the law. It's like if the thing sells, how, why is that thing worth it? It's because it's sold for that much. That's the way NFTs work. That's the way punks work. That's the way uh, apes work. I know there are like, for instance, like individual composers, you know, for instance, who are trying to mint their NFTs on chain and sell them for whatever point one ETH. Fine. My question is, well, why would anyone want to buy that? I think the the key question is, what is the on chain classical music product that will sell for five ETH, ten ETH, twenty ETH? If I were a musician trying to figure this out. That is the question I would be dedicating myself to. What is the thing that I can repeatedly sell for five ETH. And once you prove that, once you've made 50 ETH from that, 100 ETH from that, then everyone's going to obviously come because why wouldn't they? <laughs> Otherwise, you have, the, you have a monopoly, right? You have the market to yourself, right? So by our competitive arbitrage, people have to come. So if you want more people to come, I think the prove thing it. to focus on is actually building that musical product that's going to generate the revenue that will incentivize people to come. Now, maybe you need to do some amount of coaxing to get a critical mass of people to create that product. That's possible. Because I don't know what that product is. I couldn't tell you. Because maybe it's an orchestral thing. Maybe you need a full orchestra. Maybe it needs to be a chamber music thing. I don't quite know. Maybe you need a videographer. I'm not sure what it is. I, I, don't, I don't have that answer for you. But once you build the product and you prove the market fit, if they deny it, who cares? Because they're just going to get left behind. Right now, there is no train that has left the station yet. I think the thing to do is start the train. Look, Yuga, I see so many parallels between this and Web 2. I cannot tell Who drew you. is like... <laughs> ah. this way, this way, this way. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many teachers and colleagues at the time, yeah. like 2014, they were telling me, you're wasting your time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But now I have LA Phil, NEC, paying consulting firms to talk to me to Artists. ask me how to do a youtube channel or how to do an yeah. instagram campaign so your thesis is correct from my personal experience when you make the proof of concept undeniable and what's beautiful about that is that the more competitors that join your category of production yeah. the more powerful the market share in the whole pie grows. That's right. It's rising tide. The rising, rising tide, tide lifts, lifts all boats. It's so true, bro. I hate being the dude that like dials it <laughs> back. But I think there is this whole crypto rabbit hole is so fucking deep. I've been yeah. in it for years. You've been in it for years. And so for people who are still kind of just starting to get their feet wet and trying to wrap their brain around it like an amoeba, can you explain what a smart contract is and why that's important? Most people don't even, they don't even go that deep. They just think, oh, Bitcoin, yeah. digital yeah. gold, blockchain, I know everything. But they're missing sure. out on the, the basic thing that ETH was like known for is the smart contract. So can you illuminate that? So, and how much, there's a lot to, before smart contracts. So should, should we assume sort of some basic knowledge here or? Go ahead and just lay out the quickest, dirtiest, and most in-depth okay. version of this okay. Try. I'll try. I'll you try. You got four okay. hours. Go. Okay. <laughs> I'm timing okay. you. Here we go. Okay. Um, so what is the smart contract? Before we get to that, what is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency uh, intends to be money. So we, we need to understand what money is. Uh, money is a thing that uh, satisfies certain properties. It is a store of value. It is a, uh, a medium of exchange and it is a uh, ledger of transactions. So these three properties, for instance, the US dollar is a currency, it's money. Mm -hmm. uh, now- it, It's also funny, we have to explain to our musician colleagues, colleagues what the US dollar is, because we don't we, we don't have much of that, familiar. so we do need to- We're like, not familiar. We, yeah. Oh, oh you, we haven't covered that on this? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, so the Federal yeah, you Reserve- got, <laughs> You guys haven't seen the US dollar recently. It's been a while, so like- <laughs> oh, oh, okay. All right, well, okay, well, so- 
money traditionally, why does money have value? The real answer, Paul Krugman said this, is very famous, New York Times uh, opinion column writer and also Nobel Prize winning economist. The reason uh, fiat currency like the US dollar has value is because if you don't respect it, men with guns arrest you, right? <laughs> the government enforces it. That's why the dollar is valuable, Facts. So, right? Fundamentally, there's a security budget. Uh, so you can emulate those properties of security, of medium of exchange, of store value and so on without a government without a centralized entity that enforces it, you can actually um, replicate those properties through uh, mathematics and in specifically specific aspects of cryptography, one way fun functions, elliptical curve groups uh, and hash functions, basically one way functions, irreversible mathematical functions. And those allow you to create those properties. And why do we want these? The reason we want that is if you believe that governments or centralized entities can be corrupt or corrupted, as has happened in many times throughout human history, mm -hmm. you would instead want a system that is uncorruptible because so many different people are operating it, right? So for instance, Bitcoin is an example of that, where there are many different node operators who ensure the security of the chain, so that even if one uh, person were corrupt, one node were corrupt, that wouldn't matter because of uh, this new algorithm Satoshi Nakamoto came up with called Nakamoto Consensus. And it would be prohibitively expensive for 51% of the nodes to uh, corrupt the security. That would cost so much money that it wouldn't be in anyone's financial interest to do that. So the incentives are aligned to make sure uh, that the money and the transactions are, are valid. And, and yet the network stays secure. Okay, so that's cryptocurrency. Beautiful. In that context, what are smart contracts? Smart contracts are an, a sort of an, a layer on top of that where, okay, you start out with digital money. You can send from here to there, there to there, et cetera. Smart contracts allow you to perform arbitrarily complex computations, what's called uh, essentially turn completeness. So you can do anything that a computer can do uh, and do that in a secure setting like one like Bitcoin, but uh, more, more traditionally one associates that with Ethereum because that's sort of how it was developed. So for example, something you might wanna do with a smart contract is like, okay, you know, if you're in the process of buying a house, you traditionally have to put your money in escrow and then it gets released under certain conditions. You might diverse the funds to a certain set of people, depending on what happens. If it's a you know, mortgage, you pay a certain amount uh, per month, et cetera. In the human world, right, again, humans are corruptible. You know, if the bank decides, oh, well, actually, this money you kept in escrow, you're not a legitimate buyer, uh, so uh, we're going to take it away from you, that can happen. Or if, you know, guys on like the no-fly list or whatever, like, the, you know, the bank decides, oh, okay, this guy's not legitimate anymore, they may take away the mortgage, et cetera, right? Uh, so humans are corruptible, and there's no necessary way of enforcing that. Uh, computers under the security properties of blockchain basically are not corruptible because they just do what the code says. So smart contracts are a way of encoding these uh, financial programs on chain that guarantee their execution without a risk of corruption that you might see in the human world. And that's really important for the same reasons that uh, you might think cryptocurrency is important because it's essentially a monetary system that is decentralized not prone to centralized failures uh, and uncorruptible. That mm. was the most beautiful <laughs> explanation. I want to chop that up and just like send that out as like an email newsletter. An <laughs> NFT. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna turn it into an NFT. Oh yeah, faking this podcast NFT. That's yeah, yes. the first one right there. Yeah. <laughs> My next question for you, building upon that, because NFTs are a type of smart contract. No. Yes. Yep. So can you illuminate maybe some platforms? Have you delved deeply on platforms that are, you know, uh, applying music NFTs in an effective way? Like, uh, have you heard of Async Art or Audius? Mm -hmm. Or is there another project that you're like really bullish on right now that we should be checking out? I'm surface level, level familiar with a lot of them. Okay. One of the things I want to do over this holiday break is to dig deep on a couple of them because I'm okay. not as, like I, I've looked at Audius. I've looked at sound.xyz, which seems pretty cool. Um, there are a couple of others. Uh, I think Catalog is another one. 
but yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with them, but I would really like to get into them, but I'm happy to talk about sort of any aspect of them as I understand it though. Yeah, for sure. I just was curious because like one of the bigger hurdles for adoption is finding the platform that people will upload their art to, like the decision. It's so rare for somebody in 2021, classically trained, who has recorded their own music, self-published, and believes in crypto. That's like 12 people, (laughs) right? So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the, the amount of choice that is out there, it's very difficult yeah. to figure out like what is the platform to post my stuff on. So I was just curious. Um, I guess we'll just have to circle back on that because I do need to do my research as well. Yeah. It, so I, I definitely want to do more research on that. Some off the cuff thoughts. First of all, I, I think the reason it's, it, it's actually, it is more difficult in music than in visual art where Obviously, in visual art, OpenSea had their moment. And right now, it's like, okay, if you're going to issue an NFT, you probably go to OpenSea, right? And there's mm-hmm. a couple of others, I'm sure, um, and on different blockchains. But like, it's kind of like that they're the winner in the market. Yeah. Coinbase is coming out with an NFT market too, by the way. So we'll see what yes, happens. Yes, I know. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a little shout but, out. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but whereas with music, you're right. That, that hasn't happened yet. So that is an interesting state for the market to be in. And I don't know that there's an obvious or right answer. And that's probably part of the barrier to entry is like only people who are going to be interested in researching that type of thing are going to do that. And that's kind of a high, a high barrier. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What One thought I do have, just being relatively crypto native and having talked to like, you know, folks in the NFT space and so forth, this is not financial advice. However, a lot of people do see L1 Ethereum I mean, th- that gave birth to NFTs, right? Like ERC-721 is the standard that was birthed on Ethereum. If you had a thesis that, well, if our NFTs originate on Ethereum and that's sort of the first legitimate chain, sure, you can have Solana NFTs, you can have Phantom, Terra, other NFTs, but like if Ethereum are the OG NFTs and that's where like the big action is going to happen, I don't think it's crazy to think the same thing would, would happen with music because yeah. music mm-hmm. NFTs are also going to be ERC-721s. So mm-hmm. kind of leaning into ethereum there it is expensive so that's the other thing so like if you want to proof of concept maybe you do something somewhere else but i can see it happening potentially on ethereum i wanted to continue digging in this so now that you've kind of laid the framework for smart contracts and eth and obviously one of the difficult things with music is that unlike these in the NFT art and people are like, haha, it's a JPEG and yeah, but haha, it sold for $69 million. So you can, you can laugh, you can laugh all you want on your yeah. actual yacht. You can be bored on your real yacht. Now. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. bored yeah. jokes on, on ape. you can, you can own an ape on a yacht now. Like that's a uh, real, real ape money and be bored with it. But in music, we don't really have that comparative. So obviously in physical art, there are millions and millions of dollars sunk into art ownership all right now. It's kind yeah. of like we just digitize something that's very well known and also very unregulated in the real yeah. world. Uh, so it kind of makes sense. But in music, other than the Wu Tang Clan and that uh, Martin Shkreli asshole pharmaceutical guy buying that like $2 million <laughs> Wu Tang album, I can't think of any other time where someone's really driven scarcity to the level that the rock JPEGs can get. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest barriers to entry. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do it. And so, like, that's why I'm excited about it. Maybe this is the opportunity to where people can finally enjoy the ownership of sound. It's just hard to own something that's not physical. It's not the score. It's not the MP3. It's not the file. It's sound and it's it's temporary. You can only listen to a fragment of it. And so maybe this is the opportunity for sound to have ownership because we're going to get the metaverse. We're getting VR, we're getting AR, we're getting there. Maybe suddenly sound can have a bigger role and sound ownership can have a bigger role. You mentioned one of the issues is that the train hasn't even left the station. People haven't missed anything. We're trying to figure out what is going to get this train out of here. And you know, selling for something for 20 ETH, that's great. I wanted to, uh, uh, in the latter half of this episode, play a little bit of a game and if we could just kind of over the next couple minutes before we wrap like ideate on some of the potential solutions what it could have people leave the train so obviously selling something for a hundred thousand dollars an mp3 for a hundred thousand dollars 
That'd be great. That'd be great. I'm curious about some other things. So I'll start and I'd love to hear uh, both of your ideas. If the sounds aren't, if selling sounds aren't super popular or doing stems and selling, you know, a series of a hundred stems and it builds some piece, what about owning an artist? So if there's not as much appeal, like what if we NFT, forget Joshua Bell's album, whatever. What if we NFT Joshua Bell? (laughs) <laughs> like, do would people be interested in that? I'm just spit spitballing things. What are some ideas that come for you? How are we going to get this train to leave the station? So, owning a person thing makes me uncomfortable. I have to yeah, say. I mean, as as a <laughs> yeah. black it's person, not a good, I'm like, yeah, yeah, these yeah. spitballs. Yeah. It's not a yeah. good idea. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are we leaving uh, the station? This is a safe space, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're gonna go on the record that owning people is is <laughs> not, that's good. not good. Not that, good. We yeah. don't condone that in the Faking Notes podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's this is yeah. immutable. <laughs> this is, yeah. Is, yeah. This. I had a couple thoughts on that though. Um, not on that, but like the stuff you said. So I do think you're right that owning something a, a length of time, right? That's a me- piece of music, right? As opposed to a 1024 pixel by 1024 pixel square. They're very, very different in the human experience. Think about how you interact with a phone, right? It's primarily visual. If you're on the train, you're on TikTok, it's on mute. So sound is very secondary to humans. That's like just a reality we have to deal with. So in that world, I do have trouble seeing a world where it's pure audio ownership. I do think there has to be some visual component to it. It doesn't necessarily have to be fancy. Maybe it's animated, maybe it's not, but just a waveform, an abstract waveform, by the nature of how apps are structured, I I don't think that's gonna be enough. There needs to be a visual component because humans are visual creatures and we interact with technology visually. Another point I do wanna raise, I was was talking to Lee Jin, who is a venture capitalist at Paradigm Fund, who's invested in sound.xyz. She's pretty bullish on music NFTs. I I was like, well, given this constraint, how do you know like music NFTs are going to take off? Isn't music categorically different from art in the way, Trevor, you mentioned, like, you know, owning a piece of music, it's just like not something people really conceptualize because that's just not how things work. And she was very clear about this. She, She was like, no, it's going to happen. And here's why. It was only very recently, for instance, that handbags became an item that was to be collected, right? With the advent of Louis Vuitton, Chanel, and so forth. Pre-industrial age, you know, you know, pre, let's say, 1900s, handbags were purely functional items and it would be insane to think about that having accrued value, right? And the cultural conditions changed, right? More disposable income, uh, more of a middle, upper middle class, et cetera the haute couture, so forth, changed so that the handbag became much more than a functional item. It became a collectible and it had, there was an element of scarcity to it that gave it value. And it then, you know, kind of went into the realm of high value items and arguably art. And so if you believe in that thesis, then, then there's no reason music can't have that same term. It just needs to be that right moment I would not be surprised if 20, late 2022 is not that mo- is that moment. I think it could be next year. And the only question to me is, what is that packaging? What's the visual element, especially with the classical music? Like in my mind, it could be something as simple, right? Let's say, you know, I think it's like something A that sounds pretty cool. So like it's not too avant-garde. I think you start there but it's very clearly acoustic. It's very clearly classical music. You lean into the classical music aspect of it. Maybe there's like a, the video aspect of it makes it clear that it's um, artists, like, you know, the violinist playing it. And there's some element of it that's very, that is predisposed to being NFT. So like, for instance, serialized, maybe it's like a single piece that's broken up into 20 pieces. And then you sell it as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 20, et cetera. And each, each person owns a part of it, something like that. I think, that could have potential, but again, it's it, it's very hard to predict. And 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 these are like you know the market dynamics and so forth have such, such a large say in it. But I do think you know if you if you believe in the handbag thesis, then you can also believe in the music thesis. So you're saying um, owning people on the blockchain is a bad idea. Yeah, just wanted to. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's, the handbag yeah. thesis. Wow, I've never thought about that. That's incredible. 
can I can I extrapolate on this a little bit because I couldn't Please. agree with you more, Yuga. I'm going to combine that with a couple of things that I've noticed in my life. Do you remember MySpace? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. You remember that shit? It it was honestly probably the, the best still to this date, the best digital extension of who you are that has ever been made in my humble opinion. It it, mm. it was you made your own background. You had your own song that you featured on there. You had your top friends. It was just your, you had your profile picture and you, you learned your had, first html like you had your first yeah. html you had all the surveys telling people who you were i don't think it's really been replicated in such an organic you know democratized way and the thing i want to circle back with is the song you would put on your facebook page mm. i'm willing to i mean on your myspace page i'm willing to bet that just thinking about that Whatever you put on your your MySpace page, there would be demand to actually own mm -hmm. that song. Yep, yep, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. So whenever anybody would hear that song, somebody could have the pride to say, "Like I own a part of that song." You know what I that, mean? Totally. Yeah, that's the sort of the same underlying current of like profile picture NFTs, right? It's mm -hmm. like you're identifying as either part of this tribe or like this is my vibe. Right. Mm -hmm. And not only is it my vibe that's out there, I own this vibe. I think I, I think that's really powerful. That's so powerful because music, what is music more than a vibe? And I like the way you described it as ownership over a piece of time. Now, yeah. I want to push back on one of the things you said about humans not valuing sound over visual medium. Mm. I agree, and I also disagree to a part of that. As a YouTuber and, and visual storyteller, I've also learned through the construction of my own art that humans process sound faster than mm. we do visual stimuli. And so it may be that we don't prioritize them the same way. And if you look at any like YouTube con channel construction, they always say to invest in your audio equipment first before mm. your video equipment because people are more likely to click off of a YouTube video for poor audio than poor video. If it's mm. poor audio, they're more likely to leave it. So if it has good audio but shitty video, they're more likely to stay for a longer amount of time. Mm. So I think there is some value. There are some parameters where audio is more valuable than video. Now, the way that I think about it, though, because I don't know if you heard, but like in the middle of last year, UMG, sorry, yeah, UMG sold a bunch of their music rights to TikTok. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And it was like millions and millions of songs, right? I see a future where if you own a little bit of a part of a song and it's featured in a TikTok, it's featured in a movie, featured in a TV show, somebody's got it playing in the background of their Facebook or Instagram video, the owners of that song, because it's being consumed, there's some sort of smart contract transaction that goes on in the background and those owners of that song get a little bit of value in their pocket for owning that song and having like you said the value being consumed a hundred percent yeah totally totally agree with that what is interesting to me about that and this is i don't have again i don't have that many answers here is like when you end up in that world where it's five second clips five second clip five second clip five second clip is that even classical music at that point maybe it is but like, how far Kurt are Tom. we willing to? Yeah, yeah. maybe. Tind he was Tind myth, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you 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 said the secret word, bro. Oh man. <laughs> but like, how far are we willing to deviate from sort of the original concept? I mean, maybe it's an entirely new thing, and maybe that's fine. One of the values I do like about classical music it, it is a little longer than a two minute song. It's like you know you have idea space for a full idea to be fleshed out, right? Like there's complex development and so forth. Those are the values that I do enjoy about classical music. And it's like, well, if we're gonna NFTize that and chop it up into five second things, is it like, maybe we're making money, maybe we're, we're you know, getting ETH in our pockets, but is that like really a thing we're trying to do? You know what I mean? I agree. It's a great question too. And anytime we interact with Johan, like it's always seems to be big vision and it's not just 
Besides, well, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'd love to make a bunch of money and be famous. But there is always that at the core of it, being an artist yeah. and like making impact and change that is so inspiring. It's not change for change sakes. It's like, hey, yeah. we're here to actually save this and we're doing it from the inside. We're doing it from the outside. I'm curious about that too, because continuing where yes, ending these ideas. Yeah. So we've got our digital MySpace. Tom's our friend again. Uh, I miss know, Tom. Like life's, no, uh, yeah, Tom's a friend. Life's good. We've ranked our friends in top eight fashion. We're getting in towards this metaverse. We know it's coming. We all watched that uncomfortable for 50 minutes of Zuckerberg. Should have paid an actor, but it, the metaverse is here, uh, whether we like it or, or not. And so obviously that's a place where we get that MySpace. We can get that sound. You could walk up to our Minecraft castle or whatever yep. and have that sound. You can have a sound. Um, some other ideas is we're getting the series of we're getting bored eight yacht clubs. And so like, why not write the music? Why not have, yeah. you know, yeah. 10,000 yep. serialized versions that match that they can get excited. It's 30 seconds, but it is a fair point. Okay. Let's get all the classical composers in this. Like, Oh, this is, this is what you need. Right. Cause you at least you have money. Like, is that what you want to do? Is, is that what moves the art form? But at least with my interaction with the, the younger folks, you know, like teaching, a few years back, middle schoolers, you know, this emerging age is that they've been exposed to so much different types of music, so many different cultures. They've seen literally everything thanks to being born in great internet. And I've just noticed it's it's cooler to be uncool. I mean, like, look at mm. Big Bang Theory. Like, a whole bunch of nerds was, like, the top-selling show for 10 years. Being different is now a fashionable thing. It's a badge of honor. You don't just have to be the jock uh, on the sports ball team. And so I've also noticed this kind of shift towards that, and maybe it's doing it ironically, but embracing these longer forms that while on one hand, everything's yeah. getting shorter, but on the other hand, there's all these other things that are long. There's a very yeah. popular indie game, can't remember the name, but its whole purpose is slowness. I don't remember it, but once you start it, it's a 400 day clock until like <coughs> this giant God awakens. And like it literally, it, that's the that's not even the end game time. It's it starts and it, it pairs with your clock. So some people just speed up their computer's internal clock. But the whole point, <laughs> and you're moving at this very slow person. It's beautiful art. You have such small objectives. It can take you an hour to walk across a room, and it's a very popular game to wait 400 years. And you know what happens at the end. The god awakens and he's like disappointed in you or whatever. <laughs> There's no real objective. You can't really beat this game and yet it's so popular and i've just seen in music i mean we get mac rick's max richter's sleep it's eight hours i love it it's fun there's this odd expansion and so maybe we can exist for this other crowd to where you know human nature where we live in extremes and so maybe we enter in at this extreme where things are long where people want that experience they want the meditation they want whatever it is i don't have any set solid ideas but who knows maybe that's a void we fill look like maybe it's zagging right maybe it's like <laughs> you meant the longest music song <laughs> nft it's an eight hour song it's the first eight hour song on the chain and like that that's not that crazy to me that that could be very interesting it's like you like all, yeah, oh yeah, ooh, impressive, a thousand pixels. This is this is one terabyte of sound. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. wrecks. <laughs> this will destroy your iPhone. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean that would be. I think that could be really interesting. I don't know. I think the, all these ideas are worth. I would really love to see like, you know, you guys and I mean, I, I I'd love to contribute and like I do think there is something here where we can. It's because it's so fucking early. It's so fucking early. It's crazy early. Nobody's done it. Like, and the first mover advantage here is going to be crazy. I do think there's an opportunity to just make something, something, even if it fails the first time, right? Just keep building on it. Like something musical that is worth, that has that artistic integrity that we're all very used to, put it on chain and get it validated and recognized. I do think there's an opportunity there. Mm. Why are you revealing my plans, bro? <laughs> like, why are you why are you doxing my plans, y'all? It's decentralized. <laughs> we all know that. No, it's huge. And 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 I want to reiterate what you were saying earlier, Yuga, about like that first 50 ETH sale, right? And I know for a fact that the music video is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that I just keep coming back to TikTok because what's so interesting about it is you could have one sound or one dialogue and you can get 50 different iterations on it, right? You can get remixed over and over and over again. And what is music if not just a remixing of similar ideas and a similar pattern over and over and over in a form we call genre? So what's really cool is like maybe when somebody listens to something on the blockchain, like a little two minute song, three minute song, they take it, flip it, give homage to the original creator and they make something new. And the original Mm -hmm. creator makes something off of that art. So it's kind of like, you know, how Brahms with the first symphony totally stole from Beethoven, uh, Beethoven's ninth symphony. It's like if, if, you know, Beethoven's estate got, got a little bit of a kickback. (laughs) <laughs> you know, from that, from that that biting, I don't know, but I I agree with what both you both of you said. Both extremes, short and long, are gonna have a place in here, and different artists will fill that niche. It's a whole new ecosystem.